Okay. Hello, everybody. This All right. Is Jorge. So Ayarza. we're going to start here with Jorge Ayarza's presentation on the downwind design um, of the Hugh Piggott turbines that he's doing um, in India. He's going to tell us a little bit about the development of several blade designs that they've been doing the past few months. And so we're excited to have him here with us today uh, to give us this presentation. All right, Jorge, okay, we're ready for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessica. So um, I'm actually uh, with an organization called Minbayu, and we're based in uh, South India. And uh, I've been lucky enough to have a group of engineers and engineering students uh, they have come and uh, worked in this project for the last uh, several months. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of them, Ryan, which was working on the blade design, is actually on a bus traveling to North India right now, so it's, he cannot make it live. But he's available for questions later on if people have questions. Um, but I do have a colleague, uh, Rohin, who's here with me. So we will both uh, be giving the presentation um, uh, on this downwind design. So I'll go to the next page. How does it work? Okay. So the design targets. Um, essentially, uh, we're in a location here in Oroville, which is a village near Pondicherry in South India, in Tamil Nadu state. Um, here the winds are not as great as in the further south of the country. Uh, our, um, our location is also uh, impacted by the fact that we're surrounded by a lot of trees. We're in, basically in a forest area. And nonetheless, there is always interest in using renewables here because most of the houses are solar. Um, and especially in uh, times of the monsoon season, for example, where there may be some wind but be a lack of solar. Um, the battery banks tend to be quite low in uh, charge, and therefore having a hybrid system sounded very interesting. So it's, a, it's an application for hybrids, wind and solar. And, uh, and this has been done for the last almost five years that we've been working here. And uh, one of the big challenges was for us uh, making a system that would be actually a little bit lighter, maybe. Um, and also uh, a, a challenge of trying to get even more power out of the system. Um, Hughes design is fantastic. It's uh, something that we've been building for several years now. And, uh, and uh, we've actually had the opportunity to survive through a cyclone. So we were hit uh, by a cyclone directly in two systems, uh, a three meter turbine and a 1.8 meter turbine were actually running uh, before, during, and after the cyclone. So we could say they're tested for cyclone winds. <laughs> um, now the, the design ch challenges are then for us now to continue the development of a machine that would have an even larger swept area. Um, a, our interest also is to try to somewhat simplify the machine by eliminating the tail. Um, the, the options that we see in the, in the market, you could say, in the, uh, around us in the, the industry is either you have an upwind machine or a downwind machine. So we're, we're trying to go, go towards a downwind system. And we will still use, obviously, the actual first permanent generator. And uh, in addition, what we would like to do is use quite flexible blades. So that brings us a challenge of having to <clears throat> change the material from being a very stiff uh, um, wooden blade to other materials, such as maybe bamboo um, or uh, fiberglass or uh, even plastic, if that were possible. Um, I've been looking at the industry, at the systems that have been uh, built already, um, both large or, let's say, medium-sized turbines, 
and also small um, wind turbines that are downwind. And one of the ones that has really inspired me has been the Carter machine. And the Carter, the Carter turbines were built in Texas, in the US. And they were using quite flexible blades. These were actually made of fiberglass. Um, this company was in existence from the 80s to the 90s. Um, and they no longer are around. But their turbines are still running. Um, I've, I've seen turbines running in, in the UK, actually in India there's also some machines running, uh, and you can see them in the Midwest of the US. Um, at one point in time they were quite predominant, uh, let's say in the late 80s, um, but uh, essentially the design, the key design for them was lightweight, uh, being a very large rotor. Um, and uh, one interesting aspect of their blades is the fact that it actually has, uh, in the leading edge, it has some, some weights. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll explain a little bit later how that inspires our design with some drawings. Then the other design that has been quite interesting to us has been the Proven Turbine, which uh, has been made in the UK. And uh, they're pretty well known for being quite rugged. And actually, Hugh Pigo has actually worked with that company in the development of the machines. And uh, even in the conference, he mentioned some of the design considerations regarding the generator that uh, they actually have laminations in the stator, as opposed to the Hugh Pigo design, which has no laminations. Um, but the proven uh, turbines are actually smaller. They're in the uh, several kilowatt range up to I think uh, maybe 30 kilowatts uh, or so and uh, so they're obviously closer in size to what we're building. Um, then another machine that's quite interesting to look at is a Verney machine and uh, they actually managed to build up to one megawatt downwind two-bladed design and I, I feel that the Verney is basically a, a continuation of the Carter uh, machine. The, the difference is obviously that they're large um, and uh, nonetheless, they also focused on a lightweight turbine that could be lifted with uh, without the use of cranes. So they became very popular in um, in island installations with wind diesel systems, and they're based in Paris. Um, then finally, the last two are the Skystream turbine from uh, the company that used to be called Southwest Wind Power, and uh, and Ventera, which is a 15 kilowatt turbine made also in the US. Um, so these two turbines also have some unique characteristics. Uh, the Skystream in particular has a built-in electronics for a good tie. Uh, we're basically an inverter is built into the, the turbine, into the generator. And their blades are made out of plastic. And Ventera is also a downwind machine, three-bladed which uses plastic blades and uh, it has tip brakes. So this, uh, the use of tip brakes is something quite interesting um, and they seem to have developed uh, a nice design for that. Anyway, so <clears throat> we're using or we're learning from different people's um, designs uh, and uh, we're hoping to mix and match something that will be not entirely unique but at least an uh, uh, original idea in terms of simplicity of design with our new machine. Um, oh. the, we're talking about uh, flexible blades and uh, the issue is in a downwind machine, yeah, you can see in this uh, downwind design, we have uh, basically uh, these arrows, these blue arrows that I'm showing with the mouse are wind and the wind is first hitting the tower yeah, this is the tower. And then we have the generator. And then here we have the blades. And you can see that the blades are coned downwind. Yeah. Now this is a, gives us the effect similar to what would happen with um, if you were playing badminton and you hit a badminton uh, cup. Um, and uh, the moment that you hit it, uh, that cup changes direction automatically because it's also running downwind relative to the wind. So in other words, uh, the turbine will follow the wind naturally because of its downwind configuration. 
when you see further to the right of the drawing, we have more wind here. Yeah, we have the same tower, the same generator, but then we have the blades are bending downwind even further. Yeah, so uh, the fact is that uh, if we could have a turbine that bends downwind uh, with more flexible blades, uh, we're able to reduce the thrust force on the whole structure. So we're actually able to design a turbine that may be in um, a, the, the hub in itself, the body, the turbine doesn't have to, have to be so strong, and also the tower could be more lightweight. So this would be very helpful for us, let's say, in, um, when we use tall towers, then we could simplify the tower, but also the body of the turbine could be a little bit lighter. Here is a view of what we're looking at um, as a design. Um, so I have this. This is just a picture of it, but I'm going to switch to. Let's see. I'm going to switch to uh, SolidWorks, so we can see the the design in uh, a little bit more detail. So. Here we have uh, the generator, which is the same as any Hupigo generator. We have a disk, another disk, some magnets, and a stator. Yeah. So this is in one side of the of the tower. Then we have a, a rod, yeah, running through here, yeah, and connected to the blades. Now. A, you can see, let's look at it from the top, a, the, the, we, have, uh, we have the rod and we have some supports over here. A, we have three supports and two plates, one plate over here and one plate over here. In, we are missing uh, bearings, so we have a ball bearing over here and also a ball bearing over here. And in between these two plates, we actually have a flexible coupling, which is also not drawn right now. But uh, essentially, we have the generator connected directly to the blades. And, uh, and uh, the reason, uh, let me try to put this. <laughs> Are you better at this? Can we put it horizontally? Oh, there. OK. Um, what we want to do is we need to create a clearing space. You see that there's a lot of distance between the tower and the blades. Because remember, we are downwind, so the wind is coming down in this direction. Yeah, it's hitting the blades. The blades could be bending down downwards, especially when there's very high winds, yeah, or very strong gusts. But what would happen if the turbine were operating backwards? Yeah, let's say the wind changes and the turbine operates backwards. Then, if it's operating backwards, then the blades would be going like this. Yeah. So we need to make sure there's a clearance between the blade and the tower. So we're trying to create a balance between the generator weight over here and the weight of the hub over here with the blades. Yeah. Uh, we're choosing two bladed design for a couple of reasons, but uh, uh, the idea is to, one, uh, diminish the cost of the machine by reducing um, one blade, but also second, uh, if we increase the diameter of the blades, we want to be able to uh, rotate at a high enough RPM that it will actually be still a um, useful blade to match with one of the generators that we're building from the Cupigo design. So when you have a two-bladed machine, um, the RPM or the TSR, the design TSR of the machine is slightly higher um, so that it naturally rotates faster. If you have a third blade, then the rotation of the machine will actually be a little bit slower. So we want to take advantage of the two-bladed design because uh, we could actually operate at a slightly higher TSR, yeah? tip speed ratio for TSR. 
Um, another important aspect of this design is that we have to have a pin. It's actually not drawn here right now, but the, this pin is the one that connects And uh, initially we thought we could give it a shape, yeah, so we cut it in half, this would be a, a view from the top, we cut a section, and then we gave it a little bit of a shape, an aerodynamic shape. And what we did is we, uh, we're actually, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we're actually trying to, um, okay, we're trying to a, make a simple way of processing the bamboo uh, and also we're trying to test the strength of the bamboo um, and this is what we've started doing already yeah a, we grab some buckets and we have some pictures now of what we've done yeah over here you can see our simple contraption we have a piece of bamboo yeah and we put some weight in fact, we've done several different ways of testing. We've put a bunch of buckets of water with a defined weight. And, uh, and we tested, first of all, green bamboo, which was an untreated bamboo. Then the next thing we did is we started treating bamboo with fire. So as you can see here, we have a little stove, and we started cooking the bamboo. And uh, the reasons to do this is uh, when you harvest bamboo, you um, you have a lot of sugar inside of the bamboo uh, and we need to get rid of the sugar otherwise bugs are really attracted to bamboo so one method is to put it on fire yeah like we did here another method is by steaming the bamboo so we actually put the bamboo inside of a plastic pipe 
and with the use of uh, some hoses and a pressure cooker, we steamed the bamboo at around a 100 degrees C. Yeah. So uh, by steaming the bamboo, we were able to transform the sugar into resin. And uh, this also gives the ability to, of the bamboo to actually um, be able to uh, be stronger in uh, outside conditions. Uh, basically, when the manufacturer of bamboo is trying to make, let's say, outdoor quality bamboo that will withstand uh, sun and rain and uh, wind, they actually, what they do is they um, steam it and then they press it. In our case, we're not pressing it, although this could be an option if somebody wanted to do like a higher quality finish of bamboo. But we don't have the facilities for pressing. So what we're doing now is simply uh, steaming it and trying to test the bamboo for strength. Yeah. Uh, so the bamboo testing is one part of the process. The, the other part of the process is also lamination. And this we haven't, uh, we're just going to begin starting to do that soon, which is basically getting pieces of bamboo, like the one you have here in the middle, and uh, potentially making them into rectangular shapes and then gluing them together. So that way we could actually make a piece of bamboo that's whatever size that we want to do. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, but the plan is to, we already got the bamboo, so we will start processing that. And we can probably post some updates on uh, how that has come along um, into the, in the, and also how the tests have come along. Um, okay. So uh, here we have some tables of uh, what we did with uh, either raw blade uh, bamboo that's uh, made with uh, raw material, which means we just cut the bamboo from the, from the tree, and we gave it a shape, and we, we tested uh, for strength. And then the cooked bamboo, yeah? Uh, I think what we can go is to go through these rather quickly, because they're just uh, tables with numbers, but we do have some interesting graphs further down, yeah? And here we go. So we have some curves with uh, deflection versus mass. Yeah. Uh, now uh, the number of samples we have is not so much, but uh, we will continue to sample more um, more bamboo as we get more defined with the project. Um, so we'll have probably better data. Um, but uh, essentially, we we figured that bamboo is a material that could be interesting to use. We see here in the plastic deformation that we we actually reach a point at around 20. Yeah, a, this is when uh, essentially the bamboo, after reaching this uh, this point, it actually deforms and it doesn't spring back. Um, that would mean that, for example, if the wind were too high, um, the bamboo in in the in the shape and the form that we had it would only withstand up to 20. Uh, the, we have a table with uh, basically what the wind speed would be. Yeah. So the mass per blade was 20, so it's in between 15 and 20 meters per second. Yeah. The, this is for a piece of wood, a piece of a small piece of bamboo that we tested. Um, so this is not actually the full thickness of the, of the blade because we actually are still working on the design of the blade, of the final blade. So uh, this was just a preliminary test, but uh, in essence what, the, what the, our initial impressions are that there's good flexibility uh, with high loads so that uh, there is a possibility of using bamboo for, uh, for blade design. Yeah. Now the, the issue is uh, we need to create a bamboo structure that will actually be able to withstand high enough winds without uh, fully losing their uh, plasticity and uh, being able to always come back to their original shape. And this will be the, the work that we'll have in the, basically in the near future is uh, to design the blade 
Now we've uh, or design a blade that it will actually fully spring back. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, um, as I said, the quality of the bamboo will vary, but uh, we also realize that there's commercially available bamboo flooring. Yeah, we're trying to do this from uh, raw bamboo that we are harvesting locally, but uh, there is a possibility of testing some of this uh, with commercially available bamboo um, that's usually sold in the market for making floors. Uh, except that that type of bamboo is typically imported from China and we're in India so we rather try to do things locally as much as possible. But it could be an interesting test maybe in Europe if it's uh, if the only bamboo available in Europe or in the US is commercially available bamboo flooring then uh, somebody there could maybe test it and see whether or not uh, the deformation or the the, the blades um, are doing what they're supposed to do and they're actually returning back to the original position. So this would be something interesting for maybe others to try. Um, so the, the next step for us here is to actually uh, fully um, build uh, laminated bamboo blades that can be that have already been treated with uh, steam and to actually put it to the test and see how they do up in the air. Um, now with what we've had to do is try to look at alternatives for the blade design. Yeah. So what we would like to do is uh, we want to have a, a highly aerodynamic and uh, efficient blade um, that we can actually build still relatively easily. But what we see is we need to have probably a stall regulated blade, yeah. A, meaning, uh, a, for those that are not familiar with stall regulation, it's basically the aerodynamics of the blade are such that after a certain uh, wind speed, the power output of the blade will actually go down. So there's some tricks to it, and uh, we're kind of learning as we're as we're going. But uh, I think Rohin can kind of explain a little bit better, a little bit about the, how the how the blades would go into stall, and what are the challenges that we have to face with, with regards to that. So I'm, I'm, I'll pass it over to Rohin so he can mention a little bit about the blades. Hello. The important thing while uh, designing stall regulated uh, blades is to uh, is to is to know the fact that uh, the tip region of the blade contributes more to the energy and to the torque rather than the root region of the turbine blade so uh, the basic fundamental to keep in mind while designing stall regulated blades is to use different airfoils at the root and the tip region. So airfoils have uh, characteristics like uh, CL and CD which are the coefficient of lift and coefficient of drag. Now different airfoils have different uh, CL by CD versus the angle of attack characteristics. Now what what we need to do is for the tip region, we choose an airfoil which has a sharp peak in the CL by CD versus alpha graph. As you know, you can probably see by the pointer of my mouse. So this airfoil that uh, we used FX 63137, uh, it sort of has a gradual CL by CD graph over uh, the range of alpha. So this airfoil should typically be used uh, near the root region and uh, near the tip we should use an airfoil which has a sharp peak like the one I am drawing with the pointer of my mouse. So what happens is at high wind speeds where we want the blades to stall, uh, if we incorporate some sort of a break taking mechanism with the generator. So at high wind speeds, the generator doesn't 
rotate with increasing RPM. So what happens is the TSR becomes less. As the TSR becomes less, your uh, the angle of attack that the tip region of the blade sees it increases. At a, as it increases, since uh, we are using an airfoil with a sharp peak in the CL by CD data, it crosses over and the coefficient of lift starts decreasing with the coefficient of drag and hence uh, the rotor also, the RPM of the rotor also starts decreasing. So as I mentioned, the basic fundamental is to use an airfoil with a sharp CL by CD at the tip and uh, and an airfoil with a gradual CL by CD graph near the root region. But uh, say if you are actually optimizing for uh, annual energy production and if you have uh, some sort of a braking mechanism and you do not need a stall regulating mechanism, it's, it's best to use an airfoil with a gradual CL by CD graph throughout the blade. So I just went through some slides of the designs that we've, uh, we have simulated on computer and we hope to uh, fabricate them and uh, and uh, so we, we, we use the blade element momentum theory for finding out what should be the twist at different regions of the blade and you can there are many tools available educational tools and some are commercial ones so one of the one, uh, one of the tools we used was uh, q bladed so you can import airfoil data uh, from the internet and then you can uh, vary different uh, chord lengths and twist angles and see how does it impact your blade design and how does it impact your annual energy production so yeah, uh, the slide that you're currently seeing it's uh, one of the designs that we have conceptualized, and uh, it has a rotor radius of 0.75 meter and a cut-in of uh, two meter per second. Another aspect to be kept in mind while designing blades is uh, is uh, choosing the TSR. The TSR should be optimum. If it's too low, your blades will be rotating slowly and uh, the effect that you'll see is that the wind passes through the blades without the energy being extracted from it. And if your TSR is too high, you are actually the blades will will encounter a turbulence region created by the previous blade that passed through it. So, so you can consult Hugh Pigo's manual for uh, for estimating roughly the uh, the optimum TSR you need. And your TSR also has an effect on your cut-in speed. If your TSR is too high during the initial stages, your blades will see the wind coming at a large angle, and at and at that uh, point, the starting torque will not be much. So these all are factors that have to be kept in mind while designing blades, and you can just modify and uh, uh, change them in in softwares and tools just to see what. Uh, effect does it have on your energy production. So we have this slide uh, blade, blade design discussion and uh, we uh, we have just listed out uh, listed down some points that uh, maybe can help you and uh, yeah uh, if, if you're typically in yeah I think uh, for example in display design the, this is a this is typical of what large wind turbine manufacturers are doing basically if you have a low wind uh, area or an, an area where the winds are not as high as originally uh, or you know the, the, the energy class is lower than normal then you have these wind turbines that are using uh, larger blades yeah so the way I see it is for for us it's necessary here in India to have maybe a different set of blades depending on the location of uh, where you're operating. So in Oroville, which is an area with, with lower wind conditions, we need slightly larger blade uh, swept area. Um, meanwhile, in a place like uh, Bangalore or central India where the winds are better than you, or even South Tamil Nadu or the south of this state where there's a lot of wind farms, those are places where you could use a turbine with smaller um, blades. 
So the generator could still stay the same. Uh, the blades could be varying in, uh, in size. And uh, we mentioned earlier in one of the slides that it would be nice to create a database of blades. Um, so we're coming up with some solutions or some uh, ideas about blades. Uh, we would like to publish them uh, in uh, some kind of form, like uh, on a website or let's say in a Facebook page or maybe at, uh, in, a, in, in a way, it, you know, we, we can put the details of how the blade is designed um, and then other people could actually publish and also indicate their own designs and this would be an interesting database to create where we can learn from each other. Um, I think blade design is something uh, quite tricky, especially when you're doing stall regulation. Um, and uh, this is a real challenge. Um, yeah, we're talking about this rotor database. Yeah, uh, and this is some of the information that could be included. Uh, you know, blade radius, TSR, design TSR, uh, twist and profile. Um, Actually, the program that we're using, which we mentioned QBlade, it's freely available on the internet, and, uh, and it, with, with it you can um, modify a lot of things with regard to the blade and then test them out and simulate it and see how they do. Um, see how the, if the turbine is actually, or the blades are actually going into stall. Um, we actually have done four, four different models. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have them with us, but uh, uh, oops, sorry, I pressed too early. Um, we uh, we have four four different designs that we tested. Um, two of the two of one of which is the Hupigo design, and we've also tested uh, untapered blades. Um, and uh, I wish I had a graph for that, but uh, we don't. But in any case, out of those four blades, only one of them was going into stall. So that was something quite interesting, at least for me, to notice that uh, a, not all blades that we were working on, were we were able to actually make them go into stall. But maybe there is a way to make all of them go into stall, but we just don't have the experience yet of, uh, of doing that. So um, one thing that I would say is um, it would be nice to get a collaborative group of people working on this project. Uh, coming up with some solutions and it's I'm not only talking about the blades because I think the blades is just one part of it but uh, we would love to design some prototypes here and then have others try to design similar prototypes somewhere else and also with regards to the materials uh, if we're able here to test some uh, blades with bamboo maybe others would be able to test them with other materials um, we're starting with uh, around 500 watts, but our ultimate aim is to go to basically three kilowatt in size, because we have a need for water pumping systems of uh, that size. So this whole project is aiming towards the development of a, a larger machine that will actually serve uh, for agricultural purposes in in India. Um, but I'm sure the same machine could be. Uh, potentially useful anywhere else in the world and uh, I think the idea is to have some some diameters of maybe up to five meters in diameter or maybe even a little bit bigger than that um, so uh, anyway the the creation of a database uh, would be a one first good step and obviously other people testing and trying different designs and then we can share our our experiences, our successes and failures, and just uh, be able to optimize towards a really nice um, design that could be uh, tested worldwide, and then we could uh, finish the design much quicker with more people working on it. So um, if anybody wants to, well, I guess we'll have a question and answer session after this. Uh, but I will just put the contact information that we have right now. Um, so it's myself um, here in Oroville. Uh, to the on the right we have Ryan Schessler who was working on the, a lot of the design of the blades. Uh, and that's his, his email is he's based in the US and uh, Rochen who is right now here in Oroville, but he's based actually in, uh, in Delhi. 
So uh, I think that's it for now. Um, that's it. Yep. So uh, I think we can go into a question and answer session. Yes. Thank you so much, Jorge, for for that information. That it looks like you guys have been having fun testing different uh, types. Uh, for uh, types of materials for your blades, it really looks interesting. I was wondering if you um, had any videos or anything of that sort uh, showing what you guys have been doing. Uh, yeah, we we have more pictures, but uh, I don't think I have them here. Um, we don't have any videos right now. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, what we are probably going to be able to do is in the next about two weeks. We will have uh, built when probably the first prototype. Um, at least the body will be finished. Uh, we've already finished many of the parts. So even though you, I'm, I'm going to go back to the to the picture of the actual turbine, which is further up. We basically built um, this machine is. 70% uh, the parts are 70% done and uh, the blades right now we're planning on finishing the design and we're actually going to CNC the first blade so we're using a computer numeric control machine uh, um, to actually make uh, as perfect airfoil as we can and uh, we will we will actually truck test this and my hope is in probably in two weeks' time we will be able to make a video of the truck testing and we could post it, uh, post a link and put it up on YouTube. So that would be a good way of like actually seeing something in action. So um, I, right now we don't have a video, but uh, we should have it in a couple weeks. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, you can feel free to ask them. Or if you don't have a mic, you can definitely type them in the chat box and I can read them for you. Yes, hello, this is uh, Marco from Europe, actually now in Belgium. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah, it's looking uh, quite different uh, as we are currently build, building, but uh, yeah, I'm really curious about uh, the performance of this one. Uh, yeah. Question: um, uh, Would it be possible to mount uh, bamboo blades uh, on the original uh, design, or does they bend too much? I think uh, uh, we we are, once we are able to build the first couple of blades, we could probably give you a better idea whether or not the bamboo would actually be useful for our upwind design. Um, my my guess is probably you could. Um, a lot of it will have to do with like how thick or how thin we're gonna make yeah. the blades. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of variables in the in the process of building these blades. Um, my my intention is to make them flexible, uh, but uh, I'm sure, for example, by using let's say the enrol airfoils, which are thick airfoils. Um, the, that could actually be quite useful for an upwind machine. Um, so, of course, uh, I, I am using bamboo with the intention of making them flexible, um, but I'm sure you could change the direction of grain and uh, make it more stiff. So I think there's a lot of possibilities of uh, being able to use the material in whatever way you want. Uh, because it, look, it looks really interesting in uh, you using this material because uh, I think it will be much stronger than uh, the normal wood that, that we are using. Uh, yeah. What's your experience in this? Yeah, the, in fact, uh, our initial reaction was that like we were surprised that it was so flexible and it lost plasticity quite early. But then we realized that it's, it was basically because we were using a very thin and small piece of bamboo. So I think bamboo, once we start getting the thicknesses that we need, similar to the thickness that you would need for a cubicle blade, I think it will be very stiff. Yeah, yeah. it will be quite strong. Now the, there's a couple of challenges with bamboo and uh, one of them is, of course, it's a round, hollow piece of wood. 
and we're we're trying to make a more solid piece of wood. So there's a bit of work that we've had to do in order to make uh, planks. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the planks. But uh, once we have more planks and more detail of the blades that are actually being manufactured, we'll post them up and uh, let people see. Um, but uh, as I say, this is an ongoing project. And we've been working on it for several months. And I think we have several more months of work <laughs> down the line. Oh, good. It's looking promising, that's uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now uh, we're also happy to. We we will probably also build some fiberglass plates, uh, because we feel that you know, uh, not everybody has bamboo, and not everybody has red cedar, and not everybody has uh, pine of uh, good quality. Um, and in some places of the world, uh, probably fiberglass has to be used. And even in India, in some some areas, maybe there's just simply no wood available. So then uh, we decided it would be also interesting to test uh, fiberglass because it's uh, you can control the flexibility of fiberglass by changing the number of uh, laminations or the yeah, direction yeah, of the fibers, yeah. etc. So this uh, this will really, be something we'll, we'll try to look into. Yeah. Yeah, I really like uh, the uh, the natural thing of uh, the bamboo, and uh, as you know, yeah, yeah. I'm working on the. Uh, on making uh, composite blades with uh, natural fibers. Maybe uh, that would be on. really nice to see. Yeah, yeah. so you, uh, the natural fibers that you're using are like uh, hemp or...? I, I'm using jute fibers uh, jute. currently. Okay. okay. And I think in India they will be also uh, readily available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can get jute yeah. very easily. Yep. Yeah, therefore I think maybe it's also something you can try. I, I, at least I can help you with it if you want to try this. Uh, yeah, I definitely would like to hear more about it. This would be yeah. very nice to learn. Yeah. All right, yeah, all yeah. right, all right. Good. Yeah. Good. And the, the design that you're doing is an upwind or downwind uh, turbine? Is it it's a a just an uh, ordinary you pick a design. Um, yes. uh, well, I have a mold for two two meter blades, so for four meter okay. wind turbine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Very good. So, and it's uh, did you change the blade design, or are you using the you no. design? No, the blade? no, it's exactly you pick it. I actually took a wooden blade as a master. Okay. 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 Very good. Great. Thanks. And definitely uh, email us whatever information you have on the jute, uh, jute yep, uh, design. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, no problem. Do you have a question? <laughs> Are there any other questions? Okay. It looks like we don't have any other questions. Uh, I'm looking at the chat bar too, and I don't see any. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Jorge, for for taking the time and and uh, presenting your your project to us. Um, I'm sure that people will be viewing your your webinar and they'll have questions. So we'll we'll have your email address and, and other links included, so they can get in contact with you uh, for for more questions and more information. Very good. I thank you very much to you uh, for organizing this, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that come up later on. All right, sounds great. Well, you have a great day. Or evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, evening. Keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for participating as well. Thank you, Marco from from Belgium, uh, for for coming and and listening to the presentation.